Okay, well, welcome everybody to this Colossians Bible study. We're working through the book of Colossians verse by verse. If you want to catch up on uh, all the previous episodes, you can catch them on whichever podcast platform or on the uh, streaming platform you're listening on. But today we're going to be working through Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 to 23. So let's have a read of the verses and then we'll chat about them afterwards. So from verse 21, once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I Paul has become a servant. Uh, Amazing verses, jam-packed full of theology and uh, amazing insights. Um, Dr. John, we'll come to you first. Uh, Just a general question first. In these verses, what do we learn about the grace of God? Right. Well, Paul, um, basically the key words here that Paul's writing is once we were alienated from God. So there's Mm. like a kind of before and after scenario, the scenario Mm. where we're the enemies of God through our sin, Mm. alienated from God. Mm. And then the key word, we're now reconciled to God and Mm. that's through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Mm. So it's God's initiative Mm. and God has brought about this reconciliation through Mm. Christ. It's Mm. through God's action. It's not as though we have got to do anything to earn it. We just Mm. got to, to receive his gift. Mm. So it's not through our own efforts. It's God's action, not our efforts. And that's what all grace is all about. Mm. Um, since the, the theologian folks, um, he defined grace as the undeserved favor mm. of God mm. that brings to people all that they need for a living and Christian life. So it's undeserved favor mm. of God. Mm. And it's interesting in the these verses, Paul sums up the actual essence of God's grace. Mm. We... Um, we want some alienated enemies, but despite that, God's love, mercy, and forgiveness shown in Christ's sacrifice on the cross mm-hmm. brought us blessings. We're presenting holy, without blemish, free from accusation, and full of hope. Mm. So it's amazing what this is grace, amazing grace. Amazing. It, it really is amazing grace, isn't it? And I love what you're saying there. It's like, so it was once we were alienated, and it was because of our yeah. behaviors that we were alienated, but then it was. Mm through Christ's death Mm. that we were then reconciled uh, to God. And so almost maybe let's just hone in on that verse 21, Amy. Mm. Um, So it kind of talks there a little bit about, I guess, the effects of sin, doesn't it? Um, Could you just shed a little bit more light on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the first thing that we'll uh, sort of address is sin. Mm -hmm. Um, Sin's sort of an archery term, and it literally Mm. means to miss the mark, so Mm. to miss the target. And I guess that's exactly what we do when we sin, is that we miss the mark and we miss the target of doing things God's way, Mm -hmm. and we do things our own way. Right. And so in Habakkuk 1.13 as well, it tells us that actually God is so holy that he cannot tolerate sin, Mm. like he can't even look at it. And so actually, if he were to do so, that would be to violate his very essence of who he is. And so Mm. our sin, as we've sort of addressed as well, you know, it separates us from God. Right. Mm. It alienates us. And so, and this is of our own doing, you know, we, right. we choose to do that. And actually, when we do that, we separate ourselves uh, from God. And it's really interesting as well, because if you look at the term alienated, that specific mm. word that's used in Greek means to literally transfer from one owner to another. Wow. Right. And it's sort of getting at actually, you know, when we choose to sin, it's almost going from God to Satan. Luckily, you right. know, through Jesus's blood and his sacrifice, we're redeemed back to him. Mm-hmm. It's such a powerful, I think, illustration of, of what sin is. You know, right. it's not this, uh, you know, airy fairy thing, mm. but actually it's, it's got a lot of power to it. And actually we need to realize that, you know, there's significance mm-hmm. to it, yeah. but luckily we've been well, not luckily, but through God's grace, we have been redeemed yeah. back to him. Beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like, it, it's, it's, 
uh, a got a lot packed into those verses, hasn't it, Lowry? Almost like you've got, okay, so it's almost like the story of the Bible summed up in a couple of verses. Once you are alien from God, it's almost like back to Genesis when, mm. you know, initially they were with God, but then, you know, they eat the, from the tree that they shouldn't have done. And you see that effect mm. that you talked about, Amy, don't you, where they there is a barrier that is then put between uh, humans and, and God, but then it is through Jesus that we're then brought back into that uh, relationship with God mm. I mean um yeah so just uh, uh, any further comments on just how that how those verses just highlight that grace almost from our sin but then redeemed and reconciled by God's grace yeah I mean absolutely I think I mean Amy touched um really well on it and actually you know emphasized that you know we you know we were the ones that separated ourselves from God it was through the sin of Adam and that's why we got separated and that's why we became um, I guess, transferred uh, to a different ownership from the ownership of God, um, you know, to the ownership of sin. But actually, you know, through the redeeming factor of Jesus, mm. you know, coming down on earth and actually, you know, paying the price for us, actually mm. now we've been redeemed no matter what. We are now children um, of the Father. And I think sometimes when we look at sin, um, we kind of try and wonder how we look at God mm. um, and actually how we should, you know, now that we are redeemed, like, mm. you know, how do we then see sin and how do we then actually see our Father? And I think, I think actually there's two different ways that we can see it is that we mm. can see God as, you know, as, as, as a judge, right. you know, as, as the judge. And, you know, we, when, when we sinned that we were guilty before him. Mm. Um, but then, you know, in that we then need, you know, we need a uh, forgiveness and we need justification. Right. Um, and actually we can also see God as our friend. Mm. Um, and in the sense of God being our friend, we have damaged our relationship before him and therefore we, we need, um, we need reconciliation. Mm. And I think actually to see the effect of sin in that way of us, you know, hurting, um, a friend, but then also us being guilty before a judge. I think that then brings to light actually what Jesus paid for us on the cross. And actually he repaired a relationship with a friend. Yeah. But at the same time, he also paid the price for us so that we would no longer be guilty mm -hmm. before our father. And I think actually looking at it from that from that perspective makes us realize how important, actually how mm -hmm. incredible the, the love of Christ is for us. Yeah, that's amazing. It, re it really shapes a lot about how we see God, doesn't it? These yeah. verses, like knowing that that's how um, and what he did for us. And I guess, you know, uh, we've covered in previous episodes of uh, of this study just this whole section you know these verses they come at the end of quite a a, um, a powerful little section all about Jesus all about yeah. the son of God firstborn yeah. over all creation da, da, da. this is almost like the culmination and it's coming towards that for and it's like this is what Jesus has accomplished for you and it mm. comes to that in verse 22 but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death mm. to present you holy in his sight it's almost like he's he's coming to you, Dr. John you know actually this you know this mm. uh, Jesus dying it's a non-negotiable it is a key mm. thing that's happened because I guess without death there's no reconciliation Reconciliation for us, right? Uh, that's right. Um, I'd like to just quote from Ephesians. Paul, when he's writing to the Ephesians, he really sums up what grace is all about mm. and how we can receive that. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Right. And it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Right. Not by works so that no one can boast. Mm. And the Greek word there for grace is charis. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the Greek, that charis kind of carries the meaning of, of God giving. Right. Um, right. And the charismata are the gifts of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So this idea of charis is God is God giving. Mm. And I just think of the verse, John 3 16. Right. Uh, oh. God so loved the world that yeah. he gave. Yeah, he yeah. loved mm. and he gave. Mm. He, he, he had the, the, the kind of motion of love, but it didn't mm. stay there. He yeah, did yeah, something yeah. about it yeah. uh, and gave his son to reconcile us uh, back to God. That's really powerful, isn't it? It's like great. I love that. So like grace gives. Yeah. Grace mm. doesn't do nothing. Grace doesn't take grace gives something. Yeah. And that's mm. what God did for us. It's just incredible, right, Amy? And so, uh, and so, sorry, just coming to you with that thing. So, so uh, I guess to somebody who uh, looks at the Christian faith and thinks, okay, so I can see that there's some helpful philosophies in there. There's some helpful little tips for life and how to live a good life. But Jesus, you know, was he like really like, can I be, I can be a Christian without thinking that Jesus was like real and he died and he rose again, right? Why, why is Christ's death so foundational to the Christian faith? Well, it's, it's everything, isn't it? I mean, ultimately, mm. it is through Jesus's sacrifice for us, as we've been saying, that we've mm. been redeemed back to God, that we can actually, you know, live in, in relationship with mm. him. It's mm. that veil that's been torn into that actually mm. we can have a relationship mm. with him. And it's so important. I think also as well, it's important because it's historical. Yeah. Right. 
right. this happened. Yeah. This isn't just a nice story that right. we talk about. Exactly. This happened. You know, Jesus came down from heaven. He lived here on earth. He ate, he worked mm. and, mm. and he, he did all of the stuff that everybody else did, except for the mm. fact that he gave himself for us. He lived a perfect life. He didn't sin and he died a horrific death. He took mm. the weight of our sin and our shame so that we could be brought back to God. And now we get to live in the reality of that reconciliation. You know, we're mm. not alienated from God anymore. We get to experience the Holy Spirit. You know, we get to mm. experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit, all of these incredible things. Right. And um, it's because Jesus didn't meet, meet us halfway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He met us f all the way. Yeah, and he all invited way. us in to oh. accept it as well. And, mm. and it's because of that, that that then changes our future. Mm -hmm. You know, we get to have this eternal hope knowing that actually, you know, death is not the end of it. Right. Jesus defeated death. He's yeah. got the victory. That means that we have got eternity with him and it mm. gives us hope. It gives us peace. It gives us joy. Mm. It gives us so many different mm. things. And actually, you know, it's all because of this, this incredible victory mm. that Jesus has won for us on the cross. And now mm. it's completely changed the trajectory for our whole lives. It changes our, mm. our present and our future. And it, and mm. also, you know, God, he's, he's taken the, you know, Jesus has taken the sacrifice of our past as well. So it's just, it just encompasses yeah. everything. And it is right. our reality that yeah. we get to live in when we, you know, acknowledge that Jesus you know, mm. died for us and rose again from mm. the dead. Like that one moment of a uh, historical reality of mm. Christ's death changes our reality Absolutely. moment by moment, day by day. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Dr. John, go, going off script just a little bit here, but uh, um, I, I think, I think it's helpful. Uh, somebody says, okay, um, I hear that. But then does that mean that kind of faith is blind? I have to almost accept that, you know, Jesus died by blind faith. Uh, what, what would you say to that? In a sense, there's a spectrum. You can go from um, kind of blind faith where there's no evidence mm -hmm. and you just believe mm. um, to kind of so blind faith to uh, on the other end of the spectrum is where it's a kind of 100 percent evidence. Right. You know, right. No faith, as it were. Right. Sure. So in. The thing is that with the Christian faith, it's not blind faith mm, right. because there are witnesses. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so some people say, uh, oh, how can you prove God? It yeah, exists. Sure. Yeah. But the thing is, it's often they're looking for empirical evidence uh, such as experimental evidence. Mm. Put God in the mm. test tube. Right. But the evidence of witnesses mm. uh, in a court of law is powerful. People right. can be convicted, yeah. acquitted on the testimony of witnesses. That's it. Yeah. And there are many witnesses to the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm. Uh, and so in a sense, it's not just blindly accepting that. Mm. that there's, there's evidence there. That's really, really helpful. And so I guess uh, if that's something that a listener is interested in, then it's something mm. to have a little bit of a, a research in there. And I guess the Gospels them, themselves, that's what they are, isn't it? They're, they're formed from eyewitness testimony about, mm. about Jesus. So um, amazing. Okay, um, so let, let, let's move forward here. Paul used that word um, reconciled a couple of times in these verses and says that because of Jesus, we're now holy in God's sight. And he uses the phrase without blemish and free from accusation. So uh, we'll come to you, Laudu. Why would that statement there offend every religious bone yeah. in somebody's <laughs> body? And how does it encourage us to live free from guilt and shame? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, even looking at the context of the verses, we need to remember, you know, why Paul is writing um, right. to the people right. of Colossae. And I think, you know, we need to remember that actually he was writing to the people um, who were mostly Gentiles. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they were getting false teaching from all around. But then actually, mostly they were getting false teaching um, from, I guess, the Jewish side in terms of actually mm -hmm. like you need to... Judaize. Um, yeah. Um, but you need to follow the um, laws of the, of, of the Torah. Or, like mm -hmm. you, need, you need to, you know, eat um, this specific thing to be right. saved. Um, but then actually... Actually, you know, that's religiosity is that actually I need to earn my way to Jesus. Right. That actually, I need to work my way to my salvation. And actually, this is what re religiosity tells us. But then actually, you know, looking at, you know, this question that actually says that we are now without blemish and free from accusation. I think he's. You know, Paul is telling these people that actually don't listen to what anyone else tells you. Mm. Actually, mm. you have been made free blood by, by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in the same way it was relevant to them then, mm. even today for us, it's also just as relevant. Mm. Because again, yeah. religiosity says I need to earn my way to Jesus. I need to right. work hard. I need to be perfect. I need yeah, to make yeah. sure that I don't make a single mistake in my life. But then actually we need to realize that this verse is emphasizing that we haven't 
been saved through works, mm. but actually we have been saved through the grace of God. That we right. didn't deserve it. We didn't deserve a single ounce of it. We, yeah, yeah. we as as people, we we fell. You know, Adam sinned. We've mm. sinned. Mm. But then actually, the grace that Jesus has given us, actually, that has now freed us. Right. You know, it yeah. doesn't it doesn't shackle us anymore. Actually, yeah. it, it sets us free, not to go back into sin, yeah. but then actually to live the lives that God has called yeah. us to. That's such a great point as well, because I think a lot of people get you know, guilt and shame confused with conviction. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to be able to define the two because the Holy Spirit convicts us, you know, he nudges us in the right direction, but actually, you know, guilt and shame that keeps us, mm. you know, where we were, it keeps us, you know, going over past mistakes. And actually that's not where we're called right. to be actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Romans 8, 1 says, but there is no condemnation yeah, for those who are in Christ mm. Jesus. Yeah. So I think sometimes just making sure that we've got that right balance and understanding of actually, you know, there's a place of conviction where actually right. the Holy Spirit is just nudging us to mm. the right direction, nudging us closer to God. Yeah. But he's not there to guilt and shame us. Mm. Yeah, and I guess like that that that's so helpful as well because it's almost like if we take on this mindset of thinking, okay, Jesus has done most of the work, but I've still got to, I still need to make myself, you know, perfectly holy and, and, and I need to finish the work as it were, mm. or I, I, I live in that guilt and shame. It's, uh, it's, you know, it can be easy to think, well, you know, is that really so bad? But then almost, I guess if we draw down to it at the root of that, there's a belief that actually Jesus hasn't done it all. Mm. And I guess that's one of the reasons it's such a it's such a key thing, and why Paul is really driving this thing home, isn't it? Is because actually, um, you know, if Jesus is God and He's paid the ultimate sacrifice and He's done all this, well, then actually, if we live any different way, then it actually it it changes the way that we talk about and the way we see yeah. God, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, looking at um, the the writer to the Hebrews, and he uh, he was writing to Jewish people mm. and he was comparing, he was looking at the Old Testament sacrifices which were symbolic of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Right. And he's writing there in Hebrews 9, mm. the law requires nearly everything needs to be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Mm. And he goes on then to say, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many mm. and he will appear a second time. So mm. the work in taking away sins is wholly on Christ right. yeah. on his sacrifice nothing mm. that we can do yeah. so for somebody who is saying well uh, Christ has done so much but I need to do a little bit extra mm. that's not what these verses are right. saying yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Christ has taken away mm. the uh, sins of the, the world those who will accept him mm. and looking a little bit further in Paul's letter to the Colossians can mm. peep into chapter 2 because hey. it <laughs> really is relevant to, to what we're talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. that Paul goes on to say um, God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. Mm. He cancelled the record of the charges against mm. us and took it away, <coughs> nailing it to the cross. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So the word there, the Greek word um, cancelled, what it really means is kind of having blotted out, mm. having wiped out, wiped away or eliminated. Mm. So through faith in Christ's sacrifice on the cross, the record of our sins have been completely eliminated. There you go. We just have to accept his sacrifice. We don't mm. have to do anything to uh, for our sins to be forgiven except to accept him. That's mm. it. And so religious people <clears throat> who think, well, really, I need to go through all these ceremonies, I need to do all these good works to earn my salvation, yeah, yeah, that yeah. is totally, that idea, totally contrary mm. to what the gospel is and what Paul mm. is saying here. Yeah. And that's why it certainly would offend them because they want to feel that they've got to, you know, they can do something to earn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, earn the salvation. That's and it. the Bible makes it clear that you can't. That's, yeah, and it just blows your mind, doesn't it, to hear it laid out like that and with those verses. It really is amazing grace, isn't it? Mm -hmm. what, shed once for all, covers all our sins, yeah. like nailed to the cross. Absolutely incredible. Uh, okay, so let's move now into verse 23. And I, I think it's going to be really helpful, Amy, just to mm. almost make a little bit of a distinction between what we've just talked about and what it talks about in verse 23, because it says here that, uh, but now he's reconciled from verse 22, reconciled you through Christ's body, mm. through death, completely holy, if you continue in your faith, yeah. mm. established and firm and do not move from the hope held out mm. in the gospel. It almost, so, well, it does, it does say that 
the promise of verse 22. Yeah. It's contingent upon yeah. us continuing in the faith yeah. and standing firm in it. So Absolutely. what does that mean and how is it different to actually, yeah. you know, achieving salvation through what we do? Yeah, I think ultimately it's about your acceptance. Mm -hmm. So although we don't have to necessarily <clears throat> strive and work for our salvation, right. Ultimately, we've got that invitation open to us mm -hmm. and it's whether or not we choose to accept it. You know, God's right. not going to force himself on us. Mm. He's, you know, left that invitation open. And then it's up to us to continue in the faith, to keep choosing faith and to keep mm. choosing to trust God as well. I think the trust and obedience is, is really important on this. And it keeps mm. bringing to mind when I, when I heard that, you know, continuing to stand firm in our faith it kind of brought back to mind the parable that Jesus told about mm. the um, man who cho chose to build his house on the sand oh, yeah. and the one who chose to build his house on the rock. And when the storm came, you know, it was the man who actually ended up building his house on the rock. That house stood firm. And I think mm. it kind of goes back to what Colossians in, in this chapter is all about, actually making sure that our foundations mm. and what we right. understand about Christ to be true, that we're actually mm. holding firm to the scriptures, that we're, you know, holding firm to to our faith and if mm. we hold firm to it then mm. we're going to be able to weather those storms we're going to mm. we're going to be able to get through those storms yeah. and i think that's kind of what paul's trying to do here he's trying to encourage you know the colossians that actually you know he, he mm. kind of almost implies that he believes they'll continue with their faith mm. but nevertheless it's about continuing the faith to the end that's, yeah. that's really important right yeah this is all, there's that's really really helpful it's, it's there's a little bit of a similarity Dr. john almost to that just to bring it back to hebrews again the the, the crossover almost hebrews talks about like running that race doesn't it and it's yeah. almost like finishing that race is the image you get here yes because the, the writer to hebrews in looking at chapter 10 he's going on and talking about people falling away right. from the faith mm. Um, abandoning the faith mm. but then he goes on to say this is hebrews ten thirty nine, but we are not like those who turn away from god to their own destruction we are the faithful ones whose mm. souls will be saved mm. and but i'm thinking of the parable that jesus told also of the the sower mm. that um, it, the seed represented the word of god and people received that but some people due to persecution they fell away, mm. they didn't produce fruit, mm. or it could be the deceitfulness, it says, of riches and yeah, yeah, wealth, yeah. all these different things. Um, their heart wasn't really receptive. They, they took it on board, and then when trouble came, mm. they fell away. Mm. And I think what Paul, he, he may have in, in mind those uh, sayings and uh, parables of Jesus, because mm. what he's saying is, you know, don't do that, you know, yeah, carry yeah, yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Be the ones where the seed falls in the good, good soil mm. in a good heart yeah. uh, it's not through our own work it's mm. through the work of god and the holy yeah. spirit helping us yeah, yeah, yeah. but we produce good fruit yeah. mm -hmm. beautiful there's beautiful that, that's really really beautiful i guess it um just drawing on what you're both saying it's almost like there's there's a sense of keeping a purity of faith mm. in there as well mm. almost like mm. like holding to that faith not letting it be corrupted louder you were talking about there's these false teachings going around not letting that be not letting those corrupt this amazing grace that we've yeah. received but yeah. standing firm and holding to that that's our gospel mm. that is our faith uh, there are amazing verses colossians mm. chapter 1 verses 21 to 23 i'm sure there's a whole lot more we could say but we'll finish there why don't you go have a little read of them for yourself and we'll see you next time <laughs>